So in this video here, what I'm going to talk about is a couple of different ways in which insects behaviorally can find more suitable environments in which to survive and reproduce and um, when insects find themselves in unfavorable environments where survival, development, and so on are suboptimal uh, or maybe even uh, lethal to them, they have a few different ways to deal with, the, with these situations. So we're going to talk about temperature primarily, but I'll show some examples with, um, with moisture as well. Uh, but behaviorally, they can find uh, and locate different places in the environment that actually are more suitable uh, for them. So let me give you a couple of examples uh, how this might actually occur. Behavioral ways in which uh, insects can regulate their temperature. Remember, they're ectothermic, so they've got to deal with what, what there is in the environment. So one way that they can actually do this is to aggregate. Uh, insects can f uh, sometimes form uh, different species, uh, can form groups, and these groups uh, can maintain body heat, can maintain local temperatures higher than the local environment in a couple of different ways. Uh, for example, the eastern tent caterpillar, caterpillar Malacosoma in the early spring will create these webbed shelters and uh, different um, individuals uh, that are unrelated will actually cohabit these particular shelters. And these shelters slow, the, slow air movement and therefore uh, reduce uh, dissipative uh, heat loss. And uh, they can also position their, um, uh, these shelters in different uh, orientations on uh, trees so that they get the most amount of sun. So this is a way in which they can create a locally favorable environment when the overall um, environment may be unfavorable at that time of year. Okay, I just told you that insects cannot actually create their own heat. There are a few exceptions to this, and this is actually what makes insects so cool. Uh, one is the um, ability of insects to actually shiver. Uh, some insects do this uh, pretty well. Bumblebees are actually uh, some cold adapted species. Uh, they're furry, so they can actually maintain body heat just by their structure. Uh, that thermal layer actually uh, prevents heat from getting lost into the environment. They can also disengage their flight musculature from their thorax and by rapidly contracting their, uh, their thoracic uh, flight musculature, they can actually generate uh, metabolic or they can actually generate physiological heat. And so here you can actually see, here you can actually see what the uh, external temperature is when uh, bees are active and what their actual body temperature is. So this is the thoracic temperature. You can put a little thermocouple inside of the thorax of, the, of bees. And this is the one-to-one -one line. This is what temperatures would be if they were exactly in equilibrium with the external environment. And what you can see is that actually there are uh, several uh, species, including this one here, the queen of Bombus frigidus. You can imagine they do really well in frigid, cold uh, environments. Uh, that uh, are able to maintain their body temperatures much higher than uh, than the ambient temperatures, including uh, you know uh, at uh, you know almost uh, 97 degrees uh, here when the outside temperature 97 Fahrenheit when the outside temperature is only like 50 degrees. So this is like me and you, um, and they're not the only ones that can do this. Uh, there's some actual solitary bees uh, that that can do this uh, as well. This tends to be the exception uh, rather than the norm, but it's a pretty clever adaptation nonetheless. This one here, you can chalk it up to uh, behavior, uh, but it's a very interesting and cool social uh, behavior. And that is the formation of structures that actually can regulate uh, temperatures uh, at the colony level. This is an example of uh, tropical African uh, termites that create these unbelievably uh, ornate cathedral-like structures in the savanna. And the shape of these uh, structures, so the colony of uh, termites actually is uh, somewhere in here, the shape of these structures is designed so as to generate air circulation so that in very open, hot environments, like out here in the open, they tend to be more pillar-like and create more of a suction uh, by, by, by nature of the design. They create more of an airflow by the nature of these tall chimneys. Whereas when uh, the termite mounds, this is the same exact species, 
uh, when the termite mound occurs under the understory and the heat accumulation is not as uh, critical, they actually make more dome-like mounds uh, that look something like this uh, that are better at um, uh, that are better at maintaining uh, temperature under slightly lower environmental uh, conditions. And they position their brood galleries in just the right place so that they can maintain an internal temperature of these um, of these structures at around 30 degrees C and amazingly at a very high constant uh, relative humidity. And this is really important because termites culture fungi that they actually use to decompose and break down um, uh, break down the plant material that they bring in. So they need to keep this very uh, consistent environment for the farming that they actually do. It's also important that they maintain a low carbon dioxide uh, concentration because there's so much metabolic activity that's happening during the breakdown of the uh, of the leaf material that there's a need to get oxygen uh, in there. So it's this very careful balance between maintaining just the right temperature, just the right humidity, and then just the right airflow so that the conditions for the breakdown of uh, their food items is uh, maintained and the, and the rearing of their, uh, of their young is also maintained uh, at just the, in just the right way. And so this is an example of, uh, again, like under what conditions uh, the, uh, um, the different types of structures uh, are actually uh, created. And I'll, and I'll point you to this study here that uh, kind of highlights um, the different ways in which those environmental conditions within uh, a colony is maintained uh, de depending on the structure that they form. Now, what if it's too hot? Well, maybe you and I would go to a nice uh, place like this over here in the shade and uh, dip our feet uh, in the water and kind of stay cool. Uh, but uh, if you're an insect, you might not always have uh, the opportunity uh, to do that. So let me show you this unbelievably uh, cool uh, story having to do with dung beetles living in uh, the savanna. What you'll see in this video is this little dung beetle kind of kicking head down, kicking the, their uh, dung ball around. Uh, dung beetles actually um, will carve out a piece of dung from their host will uh, move it around uh, away from the original dung pile and uh, lay their eggs uh, in it where their larvae eventually develop. Um, and in doing so, they're trying to get away as far as possible away from the original dung pat. And in the African savanna, temperatures can get quite, uh, quite hot. And so here's some interesting behavior that this uh, little beetle does. It kicks it around for a little bit of time and then it crawls up on top of the ball and then does this thing where it looks like it's, you know, moving its, uh, front uh, tarsi to its, uh, uh, to its mouth, and it's kind of combing itself. And then it waits there uh, a little bit. And then, you can't see this, but it kind of reorients itself. There's a whole other story to what it's actually doing when it's, when it's doing that. And then it climbs off the ball, and it kicks the ball uh, off for a little bit, and, uh, and then climbs up again and repeats this over and over as it moves the ball to, uh, to a safe uh, location. So what, what is that all about? What is going on with that? Well, in some very cool studies uh, done by a group in South Africa, what they actually noticed is that the hotter the temperature was, in uh, the hotter the air temperature was, the more likely the beetles were to get on top of their little dung balls. So here is a thermal image of the, the dung ball and uh, blue is uh, cold, cold temperatures, colder, relatively colder temperatures, uh, and the yellow and orange are kind of the warmer temperatures. And as you can see here, the dung ball is at a temperature that is much lower relative to the outside ambient temperature. And that's because it's full of water. It's uh, dung is all kinds of excreta kind of mixed in, has just come out of the intestinal tract of uh, whatever mammal uh, this was. This is probably elephant uh, dung. And it is at much lower temperature than the uh, than the temp than the ambient uh, temperature. And the hotter it is, the f the more times the beetles will climb up on top of the dung ball. Well, what happens when they climb up on top of the dung ball? So here's the temperature, or here's the period of time here. This is a time uh, trace for about a minute. Uh, this is the time period during which they're actually kicking the ball. And what they could do with these thermal cameras is actually measure the temperature of their front legs. Remember, they're kind of legs down, 
uh, front legs down uh, and hind legs kicking, uh, kicking the ball. And what they can see is that their temperatures of their front legs was getting very hot. And when they reached this stage here, they would jump up on top of the ball and they would sit there for a little bit. And because that dung ball is colder, their front legs would start to cool down. When they reached a comfortable temperature, they would kick the ball again. They get off the ball and they start kicking it again. And again, they would heat up and then they would sit on top of the ball and their legs would cool down. And when their legs got comfortable again, they'd jump on top and they'd kick it again. And they do this over and over, trying to maintain that temperature by sitting and cuddling up next to this dung ball there. And what you can see is that thoracic temperatures don't fluctuate uh, as much, although they seem to be overheating here uh, a little bit. The longer they were off the ground, the uh, lower the tibial temperatures were. So this is again consistent with this idea that they were able to cool off on this cold, uh, wet dung ball. And then they did another really clever experiment, which is they said, well, if, um, if their legs are really overheating, and this is the mechanism by which it's happening, then what we can do is actually give them some little tennis shoes uh, here. Um, some, uh, some little uh, protectors that uh, keep them from actually uh, overheating. And uh, here's actually like these little silicone uh, shoes that they've, uh, that they've put on their, on their front uh, tibia like that. And what they actually found was that the ones uh, with the boots tended to climb up on the balls less frequently than the ones uh, without the boots. Uh, and they also did clever things like they took the balls and they put them in a microwave and kind of heated them uh, for a while and the cold balls uh, cooled down the beetles quicker and the warm balls uh, didn't cool them down as much and so they tended to climb up on top uh, you know, f uh, more often uh, than not. So this is a way that behaviorally these uh, dung beetles can actually regulate their temperature as they're moving around this really, really hot surface. It's like you and I walking around on hot sand in the... Uh, you know, in the summer uh, at the beach, we kind of jump off on top of a cold towel or so, something like that, or in the water before we can kind of scamper off to our, uh, um, to our picnic or to the car or wherever it is uh, that we're going. There's some really great other videos that I linked to uh, in our bonus material where they do some really neat things with these beetles in terms of their orientation and how they actually know where to go with their dung balls. So you might want to check those out. So again, um, uh, behaviorally, insects have all kinds of ways in which they can maintain their physiological, the, the, their body temperatures within their physiological uh, tolerances. Um, I talked about a couple of them, but there's all kinds of others, including fanning behaviors. Honeybees do this at the entrance of their hives. Uh, the way they build shelters, the way they can actually maintain a physiological uh, temperature uh, in some ways and all kinds of other ways. Dragonflies will bask themselves. Another way in which uh, insects can deal with uh, suboptimal uh, environments is to just leave them. And I don't mean just leave them uh, by moving a short distance. I mean actually migrating uh, away from these uh, uh, conditions that may have, s may have switched for the worse because of seasonality, because of uh, flooding, because of all kinds of other things. So I want to give you one example from uh, some of the work that, uh, that I was involved in working in coastal salt marshes in uh, the east coast of, of the US. And one of the things that uh, is important in understanding that trade-off, there's always trade-offs in uh, the evolution of life histories, um, is is it better to stay and kind of weather the storm, so to speak, sit, stay put and deal with a temporary disruption uh, or suboptimal uh, condition, uh, or is it more risky to stay and it's better to leave? There's, there's risk in leaving an environment. There's the risk that you'll end up someplace that actually is no better than where you are right now. So there's a trade-off that is inherent in making the right decision. Is it better to stay or is it better to go? Uh, and the predictability of resources, where the good food is, uh, or where disturbance is or isn't, is what insects are trying to integrate and trying to figure out. And over evolutionary time, uh, balances have been struck so that the decisions that are made um, optimize or at the very least uh, ensure their survival under certain kinds of uh, uh, certain kinds of conditions. So let me give you uh, one example of this type of a disturbance and ephemerality uh, of resources. Uh, this is some work <clears throat> that uh, occurred in uh, coastal salt marshes. Coastal salt marshes are really interesting uh, environments. 
they're heavily influenced by the tides. Uh, these are at the fringe between the ocean and the surrounding, uh, the surrounding land. Um, there, the tides actually flood these areas twice uh, a day. Uh, there's a kind of a, lot, a high, high tide and a low, high tide, uh, followed by the low uh, periods during which uh, the, these areas dry out. Near these creeks where the water will actually flow in and then eventually flood even the non-creek side areas, near the creeks, the dominant grass that, uh, that grows there, the Spartina alterniflora, the salt marsh cordgrass, can take advantage of all kinds of nutrients, nitrogen in particular, that comes in with, uh, with the flooding. Uh, and therefore, the plants near the creeks tend to grow bigger. They're more nutritious. We'll talk about nutrition uh, coming up shortly, but they tend to be bigger and more nutritious, but they're also disturbed more frequently. And so if you're an insect, there's an advantage to staying near the creek sides. You get bigger, juicier, uh, more abundant uh, plants, um, but you get flooded out uh, twice a day. So how do you deal with, uh, with this kind of environment? And the contrast is out here, right behind the flood zone, is actually Spartina, the same exact species that grows really short. You know, rather than being you know a meter tall, sometimes these plants are only three inches tall, ten centimeters uh, tall, and they tend to be lower in in quality. The dominant herbivore in these uh, salt marshes is the salt marsh plant hopper. The I'm sorry, the uh, Spartina uh, feeding Procolesia uh, plant hopper. These are little homopterans. Uh, and you can see actually two different species here, this tan colored one and this uh, more grayish drab uh, colored one right here. If you were to pull out the front wings of these uh, plant hoppers, you would actually notice, like all uh, insects, they have two pairs of wings, the front wings and the hind wings. This species here, Procolesia dolis, actually has a very reduced set of hind wings that makes them not very good at flying around. The hind wings are really what power flight uh, during um, for, for this uh, species. This species here, Procolesia marginata, actually has this very large and very flight capable uh, set of hind wings. And so they have two very different strategies. Procolesia dolis is not capable of long distance dispersal very well, and Procolesia marginata is. And what you find is that Procolesia marginata is more common near the creek sides that have that high juicy uh, plant material and yet get disturbed twice a day. But they have the capacity to disperse. And so they pick up and they move around during the day as this area floods, uh, floods out. Perclesia dolis, on the other hand, tends to avoid those creek sides because it now has no longer the capacity to actually um, disperse and rather sits on that suboptimal uh, and rather sits on the uh, lower nutrient uh, quality plants. But it's evolved other adaptations to actually deal with low nutrient uh, content. And basically it has a giant head and pumps through a lot more of that phloem uh, uh, tissue and has a giant head and pumps through a lot more of plant juices to capture the lower nitrogen uh, that's actually there. We'll talk about those kinds of feeding strategies later on. But here's an example of uh, two different ways in which these species have dealt with ephemeral uh, environments. One of them has adapted by dispersing and getting out, of, uh, getting out of these areas. In the next video, we'll talk about ways in which species actually tolerate or deal with suboptimal sub uh, conditions by physiological uh, mechanisms rather than by behavioral mechanisms.